thanks first of all to the SERs who actually have to deal with the fallout of this speech. The Young Americans Foundation, thanks to Fred R. Allen, always for sponsoring these lectures. Today's speech was supposed to be titled, No Leftist Idiots Don't Get to Raise My Kid. And judging by the behavior of the leftists outside and the run-up to this particular event, I think it's pretty obvious why their own parents did a terrible job of raising them. which I say shout out to Governor Ralph Norton. <laughs> I really appreciate the level of generosity and open spiritedness of the dorm community here at Stanford. Apparently, the, uh, the folks at the SERs put up some posters for this lecture. They were quickly removed, which is a real free speech problem if the administration does not do anything about it. And they were replaced by a letter from the Nordelfa staff one of your dorms. Yeah, shout out to you guys too. <laughs> it says, Dear Nordelfa community, we, the Nordelfa staff, care about you, your feelings, your physical and emotional health. You matter and are welcome here in this space. We welcome and center the voices that some way we may wish to specifically marginalize and target. In that way, we support black people, people of color, non binary folks, LGBTQIA folks, Muslims, and Jews. People from diverse backgrounds learning and flourishing together is what makes Stanford and Nordelfa special, particularly if they never have to hear anything they don't want to hear. That last part didn't matter. <laughs> thank you for being you. You are a star. And don't let anyone tell you you're not. Why, thank you to Barney the Dinosaur. <laughs> Please reach out to any of us if you need to talk or need, to sit or need us to support you in any way. Honestly, if seeing a flyer requires psychological support, you needed psychological support before you saw it. was going to be about the left's attempts to rewrite American history, gender politics, basic morality, their ongoing attempts to seize the cultural and governmental heights of power in order to control how Americans raise their kids. And we'll hit some of those themes tonight. I'm sure that it'll come up during the Q&A. <clears throat> Just a quick preview. The left does, in fact, attempt to twist American history, turn it into an unalloyed story of American evil, try to divide us from each other by claiming that we are not part of the same American family, try to suggest that American history is not about the constant attempt to perfect the fulfillment of eternal American principles that are embodied in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States, but is instead a power hierarchy of dominance and cruelty. The left does indeed attempt to do that. The left does indeed attempt to shove its perverse view of gender politics down the throat of parents all over the country, and that will continue and get worse. They continue to maintain idiotically that men can be women and women can be men and women can be men, which is obviously untrue. They even maintain that small children should be able to decide whether, in fact, they are members of the opposite gender. Uh, I have a three-year-old son. Okay, that is the stupidest thing I have ever heard in my entire life. My three-year-old son is not capable of deciding what he eats in the morning. He is not capable of deciding what he wears. Well, four days ago, he was very angry, and so he decided to lie face down in a parking lot. <laughs> if I had let him do that, you know, identify as a human pancake, he would be dead right now. It is my job as a parent to ensure that I teach my children about the realities of life, the realities of biology, that I set standards for my kids, because that's what being an adult is about. Yeah. basic morality and basic law by suggesting that speech is violence and violent speech, and they are cramming that down on kids, which is why you have people protesting and suggesting that the very fact that I speak and say things that they don't like is some form of incitement or some form of violence. So we'll, we'll talk about some of that tonight, but late-breaking events have made it so that I've switched the topic of the speech. I've decided to talk about something else, and you're all just going to have to deal with it because I have a microphone. <laughs> tonight I'm going to talk about the dangerous game that's being played by two particular nasty groups who feed off one another. I'm speaking about the radical left and the alt-right. Now, I discuss the radical left on campus all the time. That's because campuses are dominated by the censorious and nasty radical left. On the other hand, I actually did question whether I wanted to talk about the alt-right tonight. One reason is because what the alt-right wants more than anything else in the world is attention. They rant, or they cry, or they even sing their white supremacist, anti-Semitic, moon-landing conspiracism into their webcams for hours at a time while insisting they don't care about attention. But of course, that's exactly what they care about the very, very most. Which is why they've been distributing calendars of conservative events.
management and encouraging trolls to show up to ask pre-written questions designed to elicit balls from like-minded idiots who populate each chan and gap. The other reason is because there is a great deal of factionalism on the alt-right. So the very term alt-right is controversial among some of its adherents. Some of them call themselves the new right and swear they despise the founders of the alt-right. Some call themselves America first, trying to hijack President Trump's slogans to give themselves the patina of credibility. More on that in a second. Some name their movements after mammals, some after amphibians. It gets confusing. It's meant to be. You see, keeping people confused is actually one of their chief tactics because it gives them room to ridicule anybody who doesn't understand all of those esoteric labels and jokes and beliefs. So why talk about the alt-right at all? The answer is simple. The radical left and the alt-right desperately need each other. Need each other. They're playing a game in which the radical left seeks to delegitimize anybody who isn't on the radical left by lumping them in with the despicable alt-right, and in which the alt-right seeks to make common cause with anybody canceled by the radical left. Specifically with supporters of President Trump, who've been maligned falsely as evil by the radical left in order to artificially boost their all right numbers. These two goals are mutually reinforcing. Now first, I want to just say, straight for the record, okay, the alt right does not mean anybody who's immigration restrictionist, or people who are pro-tariff, or people who are more isolationist on foreign policy. It's a very specific set of beliefs. And what you'll see the alt right do is adopt the beliefs of some of these other movements in order to find cover for their actual belief system, which really is quite viable. So here is how this game works. Let's say that you're on the alt-right, whatever your preferred label. I'll just call you the alt-right for purposes of this conversation because that's what you are. Let's say, for example, that you're constantly talking about white civilization. A nonsensical term, because civilization is not defined by color, but by history and culture and philosophy. But let's say that you say white civilization is under attack by multiracial hordes. Let's say that you're antipathetic toward Jews, you're enraged by the liberties guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States. Let's say you spend your days ranting about how conservatives and traditional classical liberals, you know, the sole protected force in America against the radical left, haven't conserved anything. You say that America is not a propositional or a creedal nation, even though the nation's founding literally begins with the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Let's say that you cite Christianity as the basis of your values, but you're more likely to quote Nietzsche than Christ. Let's say that you constantly lament the decline of our fundamental institutions, but you don't belong to a church, you don't belong to a bowling league, you don't belong to the Lions Club, you don't belong to the Rotary Club, you don't own a home, you don't have a grown up job, you probably aren't married, you probably aren't a parent. Let's say that your greatest achievement in life isn't family, kids, church, community, but that you once made a semi ironic meme that seven other people like you upvoted on Telegram. <laughs> agree with you. After all, your agenda is pretty disgusting. You also happen to have the unfortunate habit of saying really disgusting things when you think other people aren't listening. For example, your thought leaders, your self-proclaimed lead influencers, will say they're not on the same page as white supremacist Richard Spencer, but then they'll go on Facebook and post about the Charlottesville white supremacist rally, quote, the ruleless transnational elite know that a tidal wave of white identity is coming, and they know that once the word gets out, they will not be able to stop us. The fire rises. Really hiding the ball there, are you? Let's say that your self-proclaimed lead influencer has compared Alex Jones's ban from social media, a ban by the way which I opposed publicly, to a modern crystal knot in the beginning of a white holocaust. But when it comes to the holocaust itself, you have some questions. You do. And those questions are questions like this direct quote from a lead influencer in the alt-right. Matt says, if I take one hour to cook a batch of cookies and Cookie Monster has 15 ovens working 24 hours a day, every day for five years, how long does it take Cookie Monster to make six million batches of cookies? I don't know, that's a good question. No, that doesn't sound really correct to me. Wait a second, it takes one hour to build a batch of cookies and you have 15 ovens, probably in four different kitchens, right to 24 hours a day for five years. How long would it take to get to six million? Hmm, I don't know, it certainly wouldn't be five years, right? The math doesn't seem to add up there. None of it really adds up, none of it really makes sense. This crazy cookie analogy, six million cookies? Nah, I don't buy it. That's all irony. I'm an irony, bro. That's all irony. This is the kind of stuff some of these folks are saying. For the record, by the way, just so the facts are on the record, according to Henry Talbot, a member of the Sonder Command, who worked in several broken house gas chambers, quote, we worked in two shifts, a day shift and a night shift. On average, we incinerated 2,500 bodies a day. The procedure was to put the first body with the feet toward the muffle, back down and face up, and the second body was placed on top, again face up, but head toward the muffle. We had to work fast. The bodies put in first, soon started to burn, and their arms and legs rose up. Women's bodies burn much better and more quickly than those of men. For this reason, when a charge was burning badly, we would introduce a woman's body to accelerate the combustion." Unquote. But 
But maybe he was just being ironic, bro. In fact, it seems like some members of the alt-right have a pretty large problem with Jews generally. They'll tweet things like, quote, so-called Jewish values tend to favor liberal and internationalist positions like abortion, foreign intervention, multiculturalism, homosexuality, and mass immigration. Some of you will say that you're hurting your daily existence by Jews. We suggested that a religious Catholic who writes on my website, that a Matt Walsh, is a, quote, Shabbos boy race trader who is throwing his own people under the bus and hates white people. In fact, Walsh is, according to you, an F word, that would be for gay people, P word, as in female genitalia, race trader who works for the Jews. What prompted that outburst, by the way, on the part of this alt-right lead influencer? The fact that my friend, Matt Walsh, said that the El Paso racist shooter should be publicly executed in brutal fashion. Also, it turns out, lead influencers in the alt-right not so fond of black people either. One particular lead influencer, when asked if having sex with a dog is the same thing as having sex with a black man, said, quote, well, they would both be degenerate. Really, really classy people. So, when you believe all these garbage things, and you've said all these garbage things, and you are, in fact, a garbage human being, when your views are obviously white supremacist garbage, what do you do? You take four steps in order to legitimize yourself. Step number one, the Trump gambit. First, you declare your allegiance to President Trump, and declare that you're not really all right, even though you obviously are. You show up to lectures wearing a MAGA hat in order to get the media to cover it, and in order to demonstrate that you are truly a representative of the 63 million Trump voters. You call yourself America first, hijacking Trump's slogan, what you actually need is white Americans first. The media eat it up because the media love nothing better than, of course, lumping Trump in with particularly this group. You don't have to take my word for it, you can just ask Andrew Englund, the neo-Nazi who runs the Daily Stormer. He posted a calendar of events for all writers to attend and attack, including this particular event. And he wrote last week, quote, I think basically, we've got a model going forward that is going to work. If we get questions, we'll take questions, but simply being there and heckling in the audience relentlessly is extremely effective. And you can meet other like-minded people there this way as well. Remember, we're all good optics, na American nationalists now. Long-time readers will remember this is something I pushed very hard while others were dressing up in neo-Nazi costumes. And by talking about these issues instead of saying, gas the kikes or whatever, we are more or less immune to being fired or kicked out of school with doxed. You just, if somebody calls you alt-right, you say, no, of course I'm not an alt-right neo-Nazi racist white supremacist, I'm just an America first nationalist and a MAGA supporter. Now, this is a clever tactic. It is. Donald Trump is many things. He is not a white supremacist, and he is not an anti-Semite. His daughter is an Orthodox Jew, so is his son-in-law, so are all of his policy advisors, or at least many of his policy advisors with regard to the Middle East. Donald Trump moved the American embassy to Jerusalem in a bold move of solidarity with the people of Israel. His roundabout named for him in Jerusalem. Trump Heights, Ramat Trump, is named for him in the Golan Heights. Donald Trump has nothing to do with these so-called self-proclaimed America First ass hats. In fact, he's very close to one of the people they attack the most, Charlie Kirk. Right? Donald Trump regularly invites Charlie to official meetings in the Oval Office. But, you know, these people bought some MAGA hats, so the left will spread their lie, and they know it. Which is why, again, they're encouraging people to wear MAGA hats to events. So be on the lookout. That doesn't mean everyone with a MAGA hat is an alt-writer, obviously. What I'm saying is that the vast majority of people who wear MAGA hats are not alt-writers. I'm saying the alt-right is looking to disguise themselves specifically for purposes of publicity. Okay, step two, then you declare yourself the true conservatives, the true heirs to conservatism. Right, not a bunch of masturbating losers who live in your mother's basement. No, you're the true heirs of conservatism. The way you do this is that you simply lie about mainstream conservatives. You suggest that mainstream conservatives are insufficiently committed to social conservatism. So, one of the things that all these people in playing do the last several weeks is they show up in the Q&A lines and they ask the same nine questions. So I'm just going to knock down these questions right now, then we can actually have a real Q&A with real questions. <laughs> so they've been showing up to events and asking people like my friend Dan Crenshaw, Republican of Texas, and former Navy SEAL.
questions and don't have to deal with them in the Q&A. So a lot of these alt writers have been showing up at various events, and they've been asking questions like, how does anal sex help us win the culture war? Really, this is the thing they've been asking. I mean, I'm not sure how them masturbating to pictures of frogs helps win the culture war either, but... The purpose is to simultaneously help us edgy and also to preserve your ability to say that you were joking, but the goal is really to suggest that if you oppose the alt-right, you're in favor of destroying the traditional family, which is ridiculous. Now, the actual answer, the non snarky answer to this ridiculous question, is that criminalizing consensual activity without externalities is by definition losing the culture war. Okay, what helps America win the culture war is freedom and liberty and the government not being involved in your life. Personal activity is a sin. You know how you win that culture war? By having people join your church, by engaging with your community, by teaching your children your values. That's the way you win a culture war. In fact, in fact, I, I'm, I'm bewildered by it. There's great irony in watching all writers claim they should use the commanding heights of government to cram down their viewpoints on others, while complaining that the left uses the commanding heights of government to cram down their viewpoints on others. You can't really whine about using the government to shut down your viewpoint when you plan on using the government to shut down everybody else's viewpoint. <laughs> but many folks on the alt-right are busy playing true believers by suggesting that social conservatives like me, people who wrote entire books on the evils of pornography in American society, or people like David French, who spend their days fighting for religious freedom in court, are standing ardently in favor of drag queen story hour at the local library. Okay, newsflash. I think drag queen story hours border on child abuse. I think parents who expose young children to sexualized cross-dressing adults are doing something wrong and bad. I also think, I also think that in governmental terms, if you allow the library to decide which speech to ban, it's much more likely to ban the Bible than drag queen story hour. I'm for limited government because I do not trust the government to decide what kind of speech it wants to ban. Me personally, we can go through these real quick because I don't really care about them. First, they claim that I hate Jesus. Okay, I'm a Jew. I don't believe in Jesus. News. I, I don't mean to be facetious about this, but like this is obvious that I don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. You see, like I have a hat. It says the whole thing, the truth. With that said, I'm really, really glad that Christians do. Like really glad that Christians do. I mean actual Christians, not the fake Christians who quote Nietzsche but don't know anything about the Gospel of John. I mean the kind who go to church and seek God's grace and love their neighbors. I'm very, very happy that America is largely a Christian nation. I wish it were more so. I think American-style Christianity is one of the best things to ever happen to civilization. Ever. My best friend and business partner is a lay minister. I employ tons of Christians. I've given them the freedom and the platform to share their faith. I've written one of the best-selling conservative books of all time that basically calls for more conservatives to go back to church and argues for the value of biblical religion. Okay, a couple more of these. They say that I want America to fight wars for Israel. No, no. First of all, Israel can take care of herself. Yes. Yeah. Damn right. Yeah. Yeah. They say that I'm a chicken yeah. hawk. I want to send our boys to die, but I won't fight myself. Okay, reality. People who join the military are braver than I. They've sacrificed more than I. That is a fact. Also, no one in America sends people to die. People volunteer for our military. The draft has not been in effect for several decades. The people who join our military, they're not victims, and nothing annoys them more than being treated as victims by people who use them as political pawns. They don't need protection from me. I, like every other American, I have opinions on how to use the American military, because we have civilian control of the military here in the United States, which is a very, very good thing. But suggesting that anybody who doesn't serve in the military can't have an opinion about the use of the military is like suggesting that anybody who's not a police officer can't have opinions about how the police ought to be used. By the way, our soldiers don't need the, the victimology, the sort of patting on the back of a bunch of weak, effeminate losers who live in mom's basement. They are protecting you. They are stronger than you. Okay, other ones. I attacked the Covington kids. I mean, this one is so absurd. I literally was on the phone with the Covington. I know them personally. I was on the phone with them nearly every night, guiding them in the media and through legal strategy. Okay, I haven't revealed that publicly until now, but now that this accusation is out there, I may as well say, you can call them, you can ask them. Okay, they, they, they also suggest these folks that I didn't defend so and so when, I was, when they were banned from social media. That's probably a lie. I've basically defended everyone from being banned from social media, including people who have targeted me and, and created risk threats for me. And, 
Okay, another one they like, that I'm a grifter, right? That I make money. Welcome to America. With lots of sponsors. I'm very grateful for my sponsors. And I'm not going to apologize for the fact that I offer my sponsors a way to reach my audience. I'm very proud of them. I think their products are good. That's why I talk about them. And if it makes me money at the same time, great. I am not to make money. I like money. Congratulations to the free market economy. a few of their more policy-based claims. When you aren't lying about me or Matt Walsh or Charlie Kirk or David French or Dan Crenshaw, these folks are busy playing defender of the realm by suggesting that all immigration will be shut down on the basis of race. Not on the basis of economics, on the basis of race. Let's be clear, every country has the right and duty to defend its borders. I was for a Trump wall before Trump was for a Trump wall. Mm -hmm. Illegal immigration has been overall, not always, but overall, a massive boon to the United States. And the reason in which it is not, that's because government has basically failed to take into account economic, education, and cultural status of new immigrants. The government should take all those factors into account. Again, economic, educational, and cultural status, all of that should be taken into account. And then we should welcome new immigrants who benefit the United States. This is all very logical. By the way, I'm confused by the idea that we should not be attempting to create a brain drain to the United States by drawing immigrants who are highly qualified here. If you're America first, why don't we want more smart, principled people coming into the United States to make us stronger and Suggesting that if you're pro-Israel, this means prioritizing America over Israel. It's, it's absolute nonsense. If America had a policy that was not good for Israel, but was good for America, I would back it. They talk about the USS Liberty incident. There have been yeah. multiple studies, US Navy, Joint Jesus Gas, CIA, House, Senate, and NSA. Most of the reports, according to historian Richard Brownell, do not assign culpability for the incident. They focus on communications failures. I have to say, I'm a little bit bewildered why you're so obsessed with an incident that is now 52 years old. If you have theories that are better than those of the American government that got operators standing by, feel free to dial them and tell them about your five decade old theories about a military incident from the 1967 Six Day War. It's a direct and vital interest now in 2019. Okay, speaking of Europe. They tend to say that they, they like white European ideals. Not Western ideals. Western ideals would be a thing, right? Because you can read about Western ideals in books. White European ideals. I'm wondering exactly what they're talking about. They're not talking about Christian ideals. You can read about those in books too, right? Or Judeo-Christian ideals, which I talk about. Right? Instead, they talk about white European ideals. I'm, I'm confused. Which, what are white ideals? What do white ideals look like? Do white ideals look like... You know, like the professors at these university who are overwhelmingly light, white and overwhelmingly socialist? What do white ideals look like? How about European ideals, like the socialists over in, in various parts of Europe? Are you really happy with how Germany is being governed right now, are you? Yeah. Like, what, are, what do European ideals look like to you? Do, do the white communists at Berkeley have these white European ideals? Race does not have ideals. It's just a melanin level. It's just a skin color or a place of origin. If you think it does, you are, you are absolutely indistinguishable. You are identical to the identity politics left, to the intersectional left. Spoiler alert, the alt-right is. And then the alt-righters talk about how white, white people are superior to others, but their own idiocy and bigotry demonstrates that isn't true. <laughs> they talk about the demographic shift in the country is ruinous. They point to the fact that non-white folk tend to vote Democrat, but this ignores that voting is malleable. The fact is that a huge percentage of California Hispanics vote for Democrats. 80% of Florida Hispanics currently favor Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. And Hispanics don't vote universally one way because, because race is not the basis for voting. Ethnicity is not the basis for voting. Culture may be the basis for voting. But ethnicity is not. Race is not. Again, that is an uncontrollable factor. Culture is a different thing. That affects how people think. But none of this is about reality. Okay, so we have step one, and that is you masquerade as a magnet. And then we have step two, and then you claim that you're the true believer. And then we have step three, which is to troll, right? You just show up at places like this, and you say dumb things, and you tell your friends how cool you are, and you tell edgy jokes about the Holocaust and cookies, because, I mean, what, what could be funnier than that, obviously? Yeah, that's just good stuff. And then finally, and this is the big one, you count on the left to help you out. And this is where this nefarious lines that I've been talking about between the alt-right and the hardcore left comes in. And believe you me, the radical left will. I mean, we've seen proof of it here tonight. I'm here to cry for 40 minutes the evils of the alt-right and white supremacism. And there are people up there calling me an alt-right white supremacist. Okay, the left will literally call anybody on the right alt-right, even if we say vocally and in no uncertain terms that the alt-right is pure, unbridled, vile garbage. Even if members of the alt-right target those people on the mainstream right. Even if Donald Trump condemns the worldview 
Listen, you can argue with anything mainstream conservatives say. It's a free country. We disagree with each other pretty frequently, but there's no doubt that mainstream conservatives are pretty easily distinguishable from the alt-right. But it doesn't matter. The media will lie about this anyway. So the Boston Globe will call my website, The Daily Wire, an alt-right outlaw. So we force them to recant. The Economist will call me the alt-right sage without the rage. We'll force them to recant. Over at Boston University, where I'm speaking next week, they're festooning posters of my face with a Hitler mustache, which makes perfect sense. <laughs> Students at this university will mob people trying to put up posters for a lecture. They'll tear down banners advertising the speech and replace it with a banner reading, Be Tolerant Except Racism. I challenge you to find anything in this speech or anything else I have said that is racist. Really, I'm waiting. Operators on standby. They'll issue a flyer that literally depicts me as a cockroach on a bottle of bug spray with a label Ben Be Gone. I do love that one, I will say. That was pretty great. <laughs> My favorite thing about that is that these people, they hear dog whistles everywhere. Right? Donald Trump will say something and they'll go, oh, it's a dog whistle. I say Judeo-Christian values. And then they say, oh, it's a dog whistle. When I say Judeo-Christian values, I mean white people. <laughs> Which is obviously untrue. Dog whistles everywhere. There's dog whistles everywhere. And then they put out a poster, literally with an Orthodox Jew, on a bottle of extermination spray with me as a bug. That's not a dog whistle. That's you howling at the moon. I mean, my God. And then they're like, oh, well, you know, we just didn't know. Just, Funny, your, your antenna were up real high in terms of sensitivity for other groups. Weird that your antenna were just completely non-functional when it came to the Jews who don't break on your intersectional hierarchy of victimhood. Very odd. For every other group, we have to be careful of dog whistles that don't even make sense. When it comes to the Jews, you're like, I'll put them on a bottle of bug be gone. There's few right here. Maybe it's, I have a feeling, it might be because, unfortunately, for the intersectional left, Jews don't actually count as a quote-unquote minority group. And the only minority groups are the ones that they perceive are victimized. Jews aren't victimized enough, despite the fact that on a per capita basis, Jews are the most victimized group in the United States by hate crimes. And it isn't particularly close, by the way. But it's not just the students at this university. The media will suggest that President Trump is in league with the alt-right. Even at this late date, they'll neglect the fact that Trump has repeatedly condemned white supremacism, that he has purged his administration of people who are remotely from the alt-right, people like Steve Bannon. They'll simply overlook that Trump isn't a white supremacist. They'll declare that the MAGA hat is indeed a Nazi swastika. So, clarification for people on the left who apparently can't listen or read. If someone believes that all men are created equal, and men means like mankind, that's what the word meant when it was written in the Declaration of Independence is. If someone believes that all men are created equal, that every American should have equality before the law, in free market capitalism, in small government, in equal rights for people of all races, that person is not on the alt-right. In fact, they despise the alt-right, and the alt-right despises them. But People on the left know this, they just prefer the lie. Why? Because their goal is to delegitimize the entire right. The goal is to smear the entire right with the label all right, to shut the Overton window to everybody who's anywhere to the right of Hillary Clinton. That's precisely why the New York Times flashed a photo collage on their front page of me and Milton Friedman and Dave Rubin and Richard Spencer. The goal was to lump everybody together and then suggest that we are radicalizing the American population as though Richard Spencer and I have a damn thing in common. For the first, for the first thing I can read. <laughs> Political correctness is a weapon for the left, but it's also a weapon for the alt-right. However, Professor Steven Pinker, who the left tried to cancel for saying this, made this clear last year. He was saying that political correctness is a way for the left to shut down debate. By shutting down debate, they actually open the door to the alt-right, because they say, you can't ask certain questions. Then the questions get asked, they shut it down, and people go, wait, I'll just look online for the answer, and the first answer they find might be something from an alt-right website, and they start to take it more seriously. Right? This is something Steven Pinker said, so the left called them alt-right and shut it down. There's something that's the most nefarious of all when it comes to these sort of de facto playing off each other political lines between the far left and the all right. And that is that they actually mirror themselves in politics and culture. They both have an identity politics view. As I say, the left's view of American politics is that Americans can be identified by group. Americans are black, or Hispanic, or white, or green, or Jewish, or lesbian, or in the best of all possible worlds, a half Native American, half black, little person who is gender fluid. Right? If, you, if, if you're on the left, you don't describe people by their belief system or by what they do. You describe them by their attributes. You describe them by group attributes. And they have a whole intersectional hierarchy deciding how victimized you are based on how many of these boxes you check. The only difference between the left and the alt-right is that they reverse the hierarchy. Meaning that the left thinks that hierarchy is bad. Right? They create this hierarchy where white people are the most powerful and then progressively go all the way down to the bottom. You get the LGBT people, those are the people who are the least powerful according to this hierarchy. And they say that hierarchy is bad, you just flip the hierarchy. 
And then you have the all right. They say, no, 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 the hierarchy is good. And we should keep the hierarchy the way that it is. And then there's all the rest of us who are like, what hierarchy? There shouldn't be a hierarchy. What the hell are you talking about? We're in the All of this is terrible for the country. It's terrible for the discourse. We should be able to ask tough questions and answer them. We should. We should be able to have conversations. And we should also be able to see the difference between good, fact-based, rational answers and identity politics bullshit pandering, which is a specialty, unfortunately, of both the radical left and the alt-right. But the left won't have the conversation. The alt-right really doesn't want to either. They prefer memeing and trolling and all the rest. So, here I am, stuck in the middle with you. Anyone on the right or left who wants to have an actual conversation about tough issues that isn't the bumper sticker, but is also not willing to pretend that ugly bigotry is decency, or that identity politics reflects truth, or that trollish meaning is a substitute for an actual worldview. Let's have the conversation. Thanks so much. Happy to take your questions. First you go to family, then you go to religious community, or whatever community you're a part of. Then you go to local government, then you go to state government, then you go to the feds. Right? Meaning that there should be this, this sort of movement all the way along the line. I think that unfortunately in the United States we reversed that. And we said, okay, the, the option of first resort is to go to the federal government, and the option of second resort is to go to the state government. And at no point do you look to yourself or to your neighbors. And we've seen payments in cash form or the form of benefits as entitlements. And I don't think anybody is entitled to, to anything. And I don't think you're entitled to that stuff simply by virtue of living in America. And I think that you should feel a feeling of debt for whatever you happen to receive in the mail from other taxpayers who are affected or putting the bill for that or future generations who are. So the, the role of government should be minimal at best. You're right that there are going to be certain circumstances where the government does have to step in. I would prefer that it's local government because smaller communities have greater interest in the people who live in those communities. I care a lot more about people who live in my city than I do about people who don't live in my city. I know the people in my city. I don't know the people who don't live in my city. Yeah, so, so I think that the, this is particularly true when you're talking about people who suffer, who can't take care of themselves, legitimately can't take care of themselves, I'm talking about the severely mentally ill, then people who are severely disabled, right? people who are, who are incredibly sick. Right? If you're talking about signing some sort of benefit check to those because everything else has fallen through, without creating an incentive structure such that the community is not incentivized to take care of it, that's something I could get on board with as a last resort, but I think the problem is we've seen it as a first resort. And so, if you get to now it's a question of direction. Are we moving toward a smaller government or moving toward a bigger government? Is the problem not enough government benefits, or is the problem that government has stepped in and quashed the ability of private people to take care of each other in order to make society better, specifically for individual people, right? When somebody in my community is suffering, they go to my shul and they ask the rabbi for money, and then we all jump in. I mean, I'm a big believer in charity. I'm a big believer in people helping each other out. I think it's better for them, I think it's better for society than the government sucking enormous quantities of cash out of the system and then injecting it randomly as though they're putting filler in somebody's butt. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the talk. I just had a question about a comment you made at the beginning about uh, uh, transitioning from male to female or, or otherwise. Yes. You've talked a lot tonight about how important it is to let people believe what they want to believe and how the government and us have no say in telling people what they should think or what they should be able to say. I just wanted to ask, what's the harm, you know, if somebody's going to be ha a happier person because they say that they're a man or a woman, like, what's the harm in just letting them do it? I'm not in favor of government banning people who are adults. Children are in favor of banning because now you're talking about somebody who's not capable of consent. All of our, all of our laws are based on the ability of consent. I think that is frankly evil. I think you're making decisions for children who are not capable of making decisions for themselves that are permanent and have long lasting, significant, and severe impact. Uh, as far as adults, if you're 25 and you want to get a sex change surgery and you feel like it's going to make you feel better, you have the right to do it. You do. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I mean, the, the, the research on this stuff tends to be somewhat conflicting, but if it works for you, it works. It's a free country. Now, that's really not the question that's being asked in our society today. Because I don't think there are that many people who are like, we want to ban gender surgery for a 30 year old. And I'm not seeing the campaign for that. What I am seeing is a campaign on the left that says that my child is going to be removed from my home 10 years from now if I don't agree with the left's view of how I should treat my child's gender confusion at age 4. I see the left suggesting that they want to find me if I refuse to say that a man is a woman as a general proposition. Right? If I say that men and women are separate, then the left says this is discrimination. Or the left is going to suggest that it has no impact on my business if I employ 
a woman at Hooters and she shows up the next day as a man. Right, like that, that does have an impact on my business, right? But, but the, the, the left would suggest, well, you know, you should, you should sort of deal with it. Well, it turns out that gender does mean something and does have an actual meaning to people outside of you. I'm not going to go along with the general societal willingness to rewrite basic facets of human nature and human biology, and frankly, mammalian biology, in order to suggest that a delusion is true. Now, if the best thing for the person is for the person to, to continue, they can't change what they're thinking, there's no way for them to get out of it, they want to change their body so they feel that it's more in line with what they're thinking, more power to them, that's, that's their problem. And as I've said before, by the way, I've said this a thousand times and everybody on the left automatically ignores it, of course, I've said that if I were in a room with a transgender person having dinner with that person, I wouldn't go out of my way to call them by their biological sex. I mean, it's rude, right? I wouldn't do that if I were sitting right across from them. But if you're asking me in a public forum whether a man is a man and a woman is a woman, or asking me to call a man a woman in a public forum, the answer is no. So my question is about abortion. Um, 
um, that's the issue that I disagree on. Um, you, you make a very good argument, and I'm going to run with this notion that life starts at conception. Um, in Freakonomics, Stephen Levin and Stephen Dubner, Dubner, they talk about how the people who get abortions are the people who need abortions because they can't afford to raise a child, and children who grow up in households that uh, don't have the resources to raise them disproportionately become violent criminals and end up murdering people. So my question is, why do you prefer the life of the unborn fetus over the lives of existing individuals? Okay, so, a couple of answers. First, I think there are serious challenges to the, the Levitt thesis that the crime rate, so the basic thesis of Stephen Levitt and Freakonomics uh, is that the crime rate drop, the, the crime rate drop is associated with the advent of Roe versus Wade. The Roe versus Wade happened, millions of babies got aborted, and then those babies that were aborted couldn't commit crimes because of the crime rate drop. The problem is the timeline doesn't actually match up. The crime rates didn't begin to drop until 1994. Roe versus Wade happens in 1973. The vast majority of violent crime, or at least a huge plurality of violent crime, is happening for kids who are actually born, but to, who are actually who are actually between the ages of 15 and like 23. So what you would have expected is that there would have been a massive crime rate drop in the late 80s, mid to late 80s, not a crime rate drop in 1994. The reason you got a crime rate drop in 1994 was additional resources provided by the federal government and the states to police. Uh, so putting aside the statistical argument, now to the moral argument. So the moral argument is that that is being made by you, and I don't mischaracterize it, is that the probability that, or possibility that somebody's going to grow up to be a killer means that they are putting some quotient of life at risk. The problem is that you cannot kill somebody based on probability. You wouldn't do this in, in any form of life, right? If you, if you it, we, we can't have a, a Tom Cruise Minority Report approach to children or to criminals in real life, right? This is a big world. For somebody at this point in this room will commit a crime. Pretend. That crime may be serious. That doesn't mean that if I just killed everyone in the room, I've now prohibited the crime. Or if I killed one person in the room who I think is most likely to commit the crime, it's not going to worry. That if, if I killed that one person, that that would be okay. Because again, I'm making a fore judgment about behavior that is not going to occur. So it is true that a lot of people who have abortions are poor. It is true that a lot of people who have abortions may not have great resources to, to raise the child. The solution to that is not to kill the child in order to prevent possible future crime, the solution is that people should be having babies more responsibly and that local communities, particularly religious communities, should step in and help out when single moms need help. And by the way, that does happen a lot. Right? And that's something that should be happening in increasing numbers. It's also why the government should stop incentivizing single motherhood by cutting checks and playing dead.
world, because the truth is that the professors are not testing you on your actual thoughts, right? The professors very often are testing you on how well you parrot back to them their thoughts. And so, all right, fine, if that's the game, then I can play the game. But I'm not going to sacrifice my future career and earnings, simply make a point to a professor who's more than happy to lower my grade in order to, in order to punish me. So, and a little practicality goes a long way, but you should speak out when you can. The question is, when can you? Huge fan. Um, <laughs> I used to be those guys outside on the signs, and I used to be huddled in my room and open, watching you on YouTube, <laughs> watching these guys get destroyed. <laughs> um, uh, so my, my question is: uh, Have you been keeping up with what's going on with Roger Stone, and what are your thoughts and your thoughts on maybe some of the jurors or the, the judge that might be going against him? So to be honest with you, I haven't. I'll also, MC didn't kill himself. system for healthcare. Yes. It was healthcare is a right, uh, a human right for everyone. And he brought up that, you know, if you had enough money, you could pay for it, or there's a government one. Um, and it's just ideas that I never heard before. And uh, yeah. what are your thoughts? How do you refute that? So there are a couple of basic questions. And the framework I like to use when I'm talking about healthcare and thinking about healthcare uh, is that healthcare, you can have three attributes of healthcare. Affordability, quality, universality. Right? It can be cheap. It can be good. And it can be for everyone. But you can only have two of those things. You can't have all three. There is no program that is cheap and good and for everyone. It just does not work that way. Right? If it's, if it's cheap and it's universal, then you're going to end up with rational, which is sort of what you have in Canada and the UK. If you have, if you have universal and good, it ends up being pretty expensive. And that's kind of what you have in the United States, sort of, because the truth is that there is basically universal health care in the sense that if you go to the hospital, they can't turn you away. But it's very expensive in the United States. Now, it's also on demand. Yeah, like, we are the world's... The truth is, the world has a two-tier health care system. It goes like this. You live in a socialized country, and then if you have money, you come here for your surgeries. Right? But, the, but the, the question is what kind of health system you would like to create. The health system that I would prefer is one that is cheap and good, but not completely universal. And then the gaps are filled by charity hospitals, the gaps are filled by local government. The reason for that is because the vast majority of medical innovation happens in the United States. It's very easy for everybody to live off the legacy of the fact that all of the, all of the best drugs are created here, all the best surgeries are invented here, that all of the stuff that the rest of the, I mean, it's basically like the American economy, right? The American economy goes south, everybody is toast. Well, if the American medical innovation system goes south, everybody is toast. There are no new medicines that are being created. So a free market system incentivizes the creation of new, better surgeries. It incentivizes more doctors. There are doctor shortages in a lot of these places. But Singapore is, is, I mean, we can get into the vagaries of all of these systems. They're all very, very different. Um, but what I would suggest is that America needs to move in more free market direction because more free market means lower prices generally and more innovation. It doesn't achieve universality for people, for example, who have pre-existing conditions on insurance. That's where you need charity to come in and, as again, as a last resort, maybe local government. Um, 
Defense for America being not just one of the best, but the best country in the world. Sure. Okay, so the so here's how I would here's how I put it. The best baseball team in baseball is the Washington Nationals. They won the World Series. Okay? That does not mean that does not mean that every player on their team is the best at his position. Right? The United States is the best overall. If you could choose anywhere in the world to grow up, to have a chance at success, the United States would be the place. We have the most robust economy, we have freedoms that you don't have in other places in the world, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly. We have constitutional freedoms guaranteed. Right? All these things are wondrous things that not only are unique, but also undergird the rest of Western civilization. I mean, again, as the United States also is everybody else. That does not mean that I think that our generalized abortion policy is the best on Earth, nor does it mean I think that our generalized tax policy is the best on Earth. Now, it is also true that the Economic Freedom Act Index, very often like that particular study, tends to deal with regulatory climate. The United States' regulatory climate, in particular with regard to foreign investment, for example, uh, is, is weak and needs to be strengthened. That's why we all are looking to, to make it better. Right? America can get better in a variety of ways. But what I mean by that is America is the least racist country on Earth. It is the place with the most opportunity on Earth. It has done the most good for the most people in America and around the globe. America is, is the most rights-based country on Earth. It has the best creed that has ever been created by man in, in history of man. It seems like a pretty good start. But thank you so much.